Hey golfers, and welcome back to another episode of the Second Swing Thoughts podcast. And today we are filming for the second time ever a podcast from uh, the Second Swing Scottsdale store location. Um, and today the special guest is Cliff Walzak. Cliff is a master fitter down here at Second Swing, and uh, he's got a ton of experience. He's bringing it now here to the store, and he's got some fun stories that we'll talk about as well. But um, Cliff, for those maybe watching and listening, who are, aren't familiar with your background and your experience, can you maybe just kind of give them uh, a quick introduction on what you've done in golf, where you've been, and, and uh, some of the experiences that you've, you've had? Well, I started out about 40 years ago in, um, in North Carolina at a place called Pine Needles. And while I was there, we held a couple of U.S. Women's Opens, and I worked with just a plethora of elite instructors and I would say at in my 13 years there I saw a minimum of 10,000 women golfers analyzing their swings and yeah. um, you know then I realized that everybody's playing with the wrong equipment mm -hmm. so I started my club fitting um, gaining the knowledge back then yeah. in the early 80s at Pine Needles I took it out to California and worked at uh, San Jose Muni, which okay. at the time was the biggest club fitting location in Northern California. Okay. And then um, after that, I ended up with Titleist and spent 20 years working um, with the best players in the world yeah, and wow. the average guy. So it was, yeah. it was really, really fun. Yeah, that sounds like, because you know, we've talked before with some of the fitters on our on the staff here about how you know the ones that have been in in the business for a while, such as yourself, um, Larry Bob, because another one that we've talked uh, to about this, how much different club fitting is now with the technology and and back then it was kind of a what the ball what's the ball flight you're looking for and what do you want to feel and that's pretty much all you kind of were able to go off of. And it was, and what's interesting is. Larry was the master at giving a player what they wanted to see and then making the ball fly the way it needed to fly yeah. to make it the best because, you know, he was a club builder and he mm -hmm. could go in there and he, he was bending clubs and doing this and yeah. doing that. And I can remember standing on the tee with Tiger and Larry and we'd always give Tiger something that would be like his second backup and he'd work it into play. And um, we were had a set of irons, and Larry says, trace this one. So I set the iron on the table, and I trace it, and then he goes, here, put another one on there. Tiger thinks it's different. And I'm telling you, it, a 16th of an inch, he could tell. Really? And I mean, wow. it was big, and you do it, and it would be a little different peak in the toe, yeah. or a little more roundness somewhere. And he would go, nope, that's not quite it. And then Larry'd go to work and wow. make it until it was perfect. But that was how good he was yeah. at figuring that out. Right. It's it's actually it's amazing to think back with Tiger because at that you know, at that point he's in his twenties, right? He's that's kind of right as he was peaking at the around two thousand, right before then. Um, where, you know, at that age to have that much attention to detail with the equipment, um, and then obviously you guys were there servicing it and building it for him. That's a God, that had to be a wild thing, especially watching him during his prime as he's peaking and taking over the entire well, sport. It was, but you know, and then you get um, you get Adam Scott that comes out when he's 17. He yeah. comes out with Greg Norman, and you're like looking at this swing, going, "Oh my gosh, mm -hmm. who is this 17 year old who's playing bullet irons?" Wow. And, you know, we look at him and, you know, what do you want to see? What do you want to do? And he's a very flat ball flight player. Mm -hmm. So you've got to give him loft on everything. You've got yeah. to give him loft on a driver or three wood, especially that longer stuff. But, you know, he knows what he likes to see. He likes to see more offset. Mm -hmm. So that had to be done for him as opposed to Ricky, who wanted less offset. And, you know, so it was... It's really interesting with the elite player that the look was very, very important. Mm -hmm. Now, when we do the survey at Second Swing and we say, hey, what's important to you? And people will say, oh, look, and that is important, but they don't know what they're looking at. Yeah. You know, you have to go, yeah, this one's got a thicker top line. This one has a little more offset. 
this one's got a longer blade length. And all of a sudden they look down at it and they go, oh, that's <laughs> right. why I like that or I don't yeah. like that. Whereas the tour player knows what they want yeah. to see. Yeah, and then I, you'll work from there. I feel like I have, in talking with even my, my own friends, they, you know, it's like they'll grab some of my clubs or uh, they might grab, you know, other clubs from the group and they put it down. Like, I don't know why, but I, I like this club better. I like the way this looks. And they can't really quantify it or put the, the words behind it to uh, describe what they're looking at. And that's kind of it right there. And sometimes nowadays it's, we got to kind of show them, this is what the top of the sole, you know, the thickness of the head, like these things are very different from club to club. And, you know, it's funny because nowadays you have the launch monitors and the technology and the distance uh, figures all up there. So, so many golfers are attached to that instead of, you know, back decades ago and it was the look and the feel is, is what all you could really discuss with a player. And then the ball flight, of course, that was being generated as well. That's uh, it's a, it's a it's pretty crazy how it's changed, I imagine, for you, especially in the last well, couple of Well, you know, when you, when you came from... Um, Oh, we, the player wants to see his driver flatter. Yeah. You had to take the driver, put it in a mold that was specifically made for that head, heat it up, and then try and bend it without breaking it, and yeah. then take it out and show it to him. Good? Nope. Okay, we're going to heat it up. We're <laughs> going to bend it again. And then all of a sudden, you can start clicking, and you can go, okay, that's a little flatter. And, um, you know, for the, uh, for this clubs at retail yeah there was one way the sleeve went in yeah at tour you'd have different sleeves so you could make it flatter and that seemed to be something a lot of the tour players liked in their drivers yeah but sure. it, it's just very interesting yeah. to see how fine-tuned a lot of these players are to the look they want and once they see that look it's it even goes to the golf ball Oh, I you know, imagine. Somebody I imagine. comes in yeah. and they look down and one's whiter than it was than the other really, one. Really, even that. One has a certain dimple over another one and they're looking at it and you can just see them the wheels turning in there. Yeah, yeah. Because it's a little different. And it's just it's wow. really unique how fine-tuned those athletes are. Right. And especially cuz you know mentally they're they're trying to get into a mode of just not even thinking and hitting and that becomes uh, a possibility after they can trust the equipment, trust the golf ball all these other factors um, and it's just it's fascinating how like you mentioned how just attention to detail I mean we talked about Tiger and I, is there any others that jump to mind that you've worked with that like were very particular about their equipment what it looked like and and or maybe, maybe there were some that are just like whatever you think is best I'll, I'll play with yeah that that last scenario would be rare Okay. Um, yeah. In the college and junior, we would get that sometimes, sure. which was good because after you work with elite players and you go, okay, I've seen this work for the best in the world, mm. and that's what you think you could be someday, so let me steer you in that direction. Yeah, I got you. You know, but, um, you know, with the, with the irons, you know, everybody has their little thing they want to do to some degree, but... When, we're making, when we were making new irons, we tried to incorporate tour feedback. But the big one is wedges. Mm. And I probably did a thousand club fittings with Bob Vokey and uh, with players of all different skill levels. Sure. And I can remember one time um, Bob had um, a tour player over on uh, one part of our facility doing wedges. And I had this 15 year old kid or 16 year old at the time who was like, hey, you know, my wedge is going a little short. I'd like to get, a, you know, another yard or two yeah. out of this thing. What do you have? And Bob had designed a 46 degree prototype Vokey wedge rather than the, you know, wedge that came in the, in the set, set of yeah. irons. And so I said, hey, let me go ask. Bob, if this is something, you know, you can have. Yeah. So I go, hey, Bob, I get this kid over here. His name is Rory. Yeah. And he wants a stronger lofted wedge. And, you know, you got this 46 Pro. He goes, yeah, let him take it. And so that's how those things work sometimes. Yeah, interesting. That's... You know, because at the time, Rory was a, you know, he showed up as a 15-year-old yeah, yeah. young man with, from Ireland with his dad. He had a lot of skills. A year later, he shows up and he goes, hey, guess what? 
I just got a car, but I don't know if I can afford the fuel for it. I got a Volkswagen. <laughs> and then, um, you know, like something that was kind of sporty. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if I can, you know. And then, you know, course, after that, yeah. he's winning tournaments. And, yeah, you know, you get a call from your buddy in Belfast and he goes, well, Rory's got the new Range Rover. And you're like, oh, man, how times change with <laughs> right, these guys right. at that elite level. I suppose if you are that elite, 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 like young player, things can change pretty quickly. Yeah, if it's you, unbelievable. You know, you I, I was... Um, Last uh, spring, I was at ASU um, for their home tournament at Papago, walking with the Texas Tech coach. And I, mm -hmm. I used to spend a lot of time at Texas Tech. As a matter of fact, I was with them in Phoenix at the Grand Canyon course when COVID hit and stopped college golf. Mm. So a few years later, yeah, yeah. I'm there watching um, Ludwig Ober yep. um, play. And I had done his clubs when he was a freshman in college. And I really hadn't seen him since. Yeah. Then. So, um, you know, I keep track of him. I text with him and I watch him play at Papago and he's pretty darn good. And yeah. I watch him at Greyhawk and you're like, man, this kid's got a bright future. And now look at it. Yeah. It, when you talk about things changing talk quickly. Talk about a meteoric rise. Yes. I mean, and there's... Couldn't be a nicer guy. Yeah. And it, Just and great. I mean, he's now regarded as perhaps the best player off the tee, like in the world i mean he drives it well it's it's unbelievable uh so that i mean that access and and kind of the you know the relationships and the work that you've done with players and you get to see them rise and to you know the, become the best players of the world and working with them beforehand had to be really cool to like watch that growth and be a part of it with them as you sort of build the clubs that they well, needed to, to it grow was, it was fun seeing things and you know just doing other things when you I, I don't know if you're familiar with the Daryl survey, but mm -hmm. Daryl survey comes out and, you know, they go to every tournament and they're writing down what clubs everybody has in the bag. Yeah. And they do it for a lot of college events. They do it for every um, pro event. And if you go to the tour championship and you go, hey, I got the top 30, you're probably going to have mm, three or four two irons and the rest are hybrids, 19s, 21s, a bunch yeah. of five woods, a couple of seven woods. And you go to the NCAAs and you got 24 two irons. Yeah. And you go, hey, you're trying to be like these guys at the tour championship and the pros are playing golf balls right. that go here and you're trying to play something here. So, you know, you may want to think about that a little sure. bit. Sure, that's, that's kind of a... And that's really interesting to see mm -hmm. because the, you know, you get out there on tour and you're like, yeah, I got a birdie every par five. Right. And I don't want to be there hitting two iron into it and trying to hit a high cut yeah. Double crossing myself and making six yeah. when everybody else is putting for three or making a four. Yeah. It is fascinating to see how that has the the perception of the high loft at Furrywood has changed um, a lot over the last few years. And I think it kind of is sparked by tour players putting it in the bag a lot. You see a lot of guys now using that when you would have rarely ever seen those in the bag, you know, 10 plus years ago. But Unless you were it, looking in VJ's bag. True, yes. I remember he being one of them, uh, a little bit of a, an exception to the rule. Right? Absolutely. Uh, and nowadays, uh, this, I'm not, not saying that every player, it's, you know, I think you're still in the minority of players that might have like a seven wood, but it's a lot more now than there was, say, even 10 years ago. Well, what's interesting is as you go through the bag of an elite player and I first saw this with Jason Duffner because Jason Duffner played a golf ball that got retired. So his golf ball after all these years is going away yeah. and he's got to find a new one. So he came out and we probably had half a dozen balls for tour players at that time. And he came out and hit his current golf ball with every club in his bag. And then he hit every other golf ball with every club in his bag. And you look at an elite player, and if they're just hitting a standard wedge, standard nine iron and not flighting it, they're wedge, nine, eight, seven, six, five, and driver all reach the same peak height. Okay. And then you go to a four iron and you go, hey, that's seven feet lower. Is that acceptable? Or do you want to look at a hybrid or possibly a five wood to get that in the mm -hmm. air? Hey, your three wood is 20 feet lower. Do you want a little more loft on the three wood? Do you want to carry the three for off the tee or a five for in the fairway yeah. to beat up on the par fives? And that information also filtering down when you get a an elite junior or an elite college player 
and you go, hey, guess what? I just went through his bag and his peak height was the same. And you go, uh-oh, let's bet on this guy. Let's mm-hmm. not bet on the guy who's five iron is 20 feet lower yeah, and right. he's playing a two iron his three wood doesn't get in the air at all. And you know, he's just, he beats people because he's talented, but is that going to work down the road? Right. Yeah. Probably not. And so that was information you could share and it all comes from the top down. Yeah. It's I've, I've wondered too, cause I think it, I mean, in a way that's just, it's a, it's a gapping problem, but it's also a consistency in ball flight, I guess, issue that you cover in club fittings with obviously the best players in the world, but then here working with everyday players, I imagine that concern is always there. And, and that same question applies to basically everybody that comes in for a club fitting of some sort is identifying the, you know, five iron, four iron, four hybrid, five hybrid, seven wood, five wood. I mean, trying to figure out how that's all going to be navigated and using the peak height as sort of a, a starting point for that conversation. Well, with an elite player, um, we would build three, five and eights and our fitting system was three, five, and eight. So you could pretty much run the gamut of the bag. Mm-hmm. At, a, at a second swing facility, you're primarily fitting with five irons, or excuse me, seven irons. Yep. But we do have a few other full sets to look at. But you pretty much know with a seven iron, if the vertical landing, which is the combination of speed launch and spin, mm-hmm. is 45, that's going to hold a green pretty yeah. well. But your five iron's not gonna hold the green that well. If your seven iron is at 51, you go thumbs up on the five iron. Yep. And guess what? If you like a four, I'm not gonna argue with you, but I am gonna show you an alternative yeah. and you can decide if that's better or worse, or if that's the extra club in your bag. And when you go play a practice round, you go huh, four iron or four hybrid, which is the prevailing wind this week. Yeah. And do I need it into the wind or downwind and you know, that's the kind of thing that we can do here, but it's based on knowledge of right. the entire yeah. bag and how things work. Right, right, yeah. Because that that conversation I know is is it kind of relates to the whole seven wood thing, and and it's a it's a very nuanced one. But I know it's one that I know I have friends that struggle with that area of the bag, and they're wondering why can't I hit my four iron? Why can't I hit my even four hybrid sometimes? And uh, the answer for a lot of those is well, you probably could use something that gets the ball higher in the air. Um, that, that way you can land it softly on the green. And plus, typically with more spin, you get more control of that ball too. So it's not going like this as much. Um, instead, it's a more controlled, consistent flight. Yep, and for those guys, you can either play a club that's easier to get in the air, or you can stop watching YouTube videos <laughs> where it tells you to lean the shaft so far forward, yeah, yeah. and you're turning your four iron into a one iron, and right, you know your right. seven irons going 198 yards because you're just leaning that shaft forward, which seems to be very popular on the internet. Yeah, and that's one of the things that we see here is that a lot of people are picking up their instruction online, mm-hmm. and whatever they're seeing and trying to translate into their game may not be ideal for them. Which is why you would come in to get a club fitting, so you're not trying to find a club on your own and they're trying to develop a swing on their own without someone steering them in the right direction. So you see that quite a bit. And for people like uh, elite juniors and college players that have access to TrackMan, there is a thing on TrackMan called Zero Zero that a lot of people try to achieve. Mm -hmm. And I can remember being out on the corn ferry and having a player just stripe a three wood and he was two into out and one closed. And it couldn't have been a better ball flight. And he said, I can't hit this when I try to swing zero, zero. And I'm like, I've watched you hit 10 shots and you've been two into out, one closed. It's been perfect. Yeah. And you can't even swing zero, zero when you try. (laughs) And he goes, well, I need a club that flies perfect when I swing zero, zero. And Never heard from him after that year. Yeah, because he was done. So for for those listening and, and watching, zero being zero zero means a zero point zero face angle and a zero point zero uh, club path, which Correct. is basically the your club path and your face angle are exactly square at impact, which is like the hardest thing to achieve in a golf swing. It's I the mean, unicorn. It's yeah, it's it's like it's the perfect golf swing, and as we know, like repeating a golf swing, that's you know 
kind of good is like really tough. And that's why the guys on tour are getting paid. But to do zero, zero over and over is impossible. And so to your point, there's a maybe a, a today's we have when you have that information, it's almost like you're, they're seeking perfection at a level that is like you can't really attain. And at that point, with that player in particular, they're they think they're going to be swinging zero a lot, and they're not. That uh, the fact no, is, nobody and, swings zero you know, more than once a day. That's <laughs> why when you fit, you fit to what they can repeat. And yeah. if they own that swing, and it does the same thing, right. and I will tell you what, the tolerance on a tour player's swing is amazingly mm -hmm. tight yeah. compared to what your average player is, mm -hmm. and it's 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 really really good. Right. But it's not always. Zero zero, right? And it rarely is zero zero. Yeah, I mean, even so, you watch it. You watch it, any event on uh, on TV, everybody's playing a shot shape. Typically, everybody's got a go to shot shape that requires them to not hit zero zero, right? It, uh, you know, yeah. if, you a, if you hit a, a stock fade shot off the tee, I mean, John Rahm plays a big cut off the tee every time he tees off. That's not a zero zero swing. That is, you know, your club path is probably what minus four or something like that for that but he repeats it and hits it the same way every time 300 plus yards with a high cut down the middle with one of the old uh nv greens yes yes which he Those got are, two classic. weeks into his college career at oceanside titleist with ricardo relinque the spanish federation liaison at the time really when john brought him out and i he was playing <laughs> wilson clubs and i was like john let's hit some stuff and he hit it and i've still got the video he's the only one i've got a video of because i saw that and i went that's really really good nobody knows who he is so we, <laughs> <Now they> do. <laughs> we signed him up on the spot and said hey you're a titleist guy we'll take care of everything you want and I got him that NV shaft, and now that's what he's played in every head with every manufacturer he's been with. And John was playing three iron, and I think it was between his freshman and sophomore year, he came in and he said, Cliff, I want a five wood, I'm getting rid of the three iron. And he's had the five wood in the bag. And um, he also, at one point, can't quite remember when it was, but he went from a 35 to a 36 inch putter. And it was like, ooh, that's that's a little big. Yeah. And because he's beating everybody with the 35. Right, and right. He went out and beat them more with the 36. <laughs> but he knew yeah. what he wanted to see and what he wanted to feel. And it was really cool. But when you're talking about shot shape, um, when uh, when Colin was at Cal, yep. um, I was working with the Cal team and he was, a, you know, playing other equipment and he saw one of the drivers I was having one of the players hit and he goes, Hey, I really like that driver. Can you get me one? And I'm like, you hit cuts. This isn't a cut driver. You should have the three, not the two. Yeah, I like the look of that too. So I waited up, wait in the toe and all mm -hmm. that. And I, you know, gave it to him at a tournament in Chicago, the Western Am, and he puts it right in the bag. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, I got Colin Morikawa playing a, yeah. a titleist driver. <laughs> and uh, a few days later, he hands it back to me. And I said, no go. And he goes, nah, I hit it too straight. And I'm like, what do you mean you hit it too straight? And he goes, I was five yards in the left rough. And I'm like, so why don't you aim in the fairway? He goes, I don't do that. I play my he goes, cut. I want it to be 10, 15, 20 yard cut, aim at left edge, and I know it's going to be in play. I can play the entire width of the fairway. So that was one of my introductions. And that's one of the things that when you're I spent a lot of time on the course with juniors and college mm -hmm. players and you get to see where they aim and what they do when you're indoors getting a fitting and you watch somebody hit a series of shots in the bay and you're looking at the dispersion pattern and everything is 12 to 15 yards right and they're going ah oh, that's going right and you're like that's perfect yeah if it's consistent. All within three yards yeah. Aim at the left edge of the green. That thing's going to be right in the middle of the green. Aim left center of the fairway. Right. That's going to be right in the middle. I imagine you've Don't shared worry that. about hitting it straight. Yeah. You've got a perfect bait butter fade. And yeah. I imagine you you've shared that Colin Morikawa story before where it's like if, if oh, you. Oh, jeez, it's my best one. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's, it's really good because there's so many people out there that think they have a slice, a major slice. And it, it might look like a slice if they start it dead middle and it curves off into the right rough every time but if it's consistent 
a, a, a butter yeah. cut down the middle, like you said, is, is there's nothing wrong with that if you can repeat it. No, but that's why when you get into club fitting, you have to look at that and you have to go, oh, this guy came in saying that he hits this fade and he wants to mm. eliminate it. And so you go, all right, we've got some ping SFTs and mm -hmm. we've got some heads that are biased to the left a little bit. Um, and they tend to spin a little more. Yeah. And you give him one of those heads and all of a sudden he goes from 2,800, 2,900 spin to 3,500 spin and it still fades. Mm -hmm. And you go, well, all I did was then, make it go shorter. Yeah. So right. then you go, yeah, well, let me go to that low spin head and knock his spin down to 2,400 and the 12 yard fade is now an eight yard fade. The spin is less, it hits and it rolls out and you're like, done. Right. And it's the opposite of what you thought you would do when you when he came in. Yeah. Because you're trying to find the best way to optimize what he does, not what you're thinking the perfect swing is right. or this. So that's it's, fascinating. that knowledge is gained through experience. And that's some of the things that when I was working a lot with Larry, you'd go out and you'd go, why did you give him that? And I just want to see what it would do. And sometimes you'd give a slow player an X1 and they would hit it higher and straighter right. than a senior shaft mm -hmm. because it didn't kick as much. And wow. you know, you just sort of look around and go, hey, there's more than one way to get where we need to go and it might not be by the book all the time. Right. That's... And that only comes through seeing it time and time again. Yeah, That's and, one of those uh, that you probably, fun. your experience kind of creates that maybe different door, opens that different door to look through on something like that, where I imagine there's, you know, people listening or watching this that they think they, they are that player that struggles with the slice and it keeps that left to right ball flight. They just can't get rid of it. Um, but maybe it's just this different perspective that they needed to look at it and say, well, if I just aim it down the left, the, the, the line of the left rough, play that fade back or that, you know, power cut, if you will, there might not be a big change needed with driver. Uh, you might be giving up some distance, depending on how much spin is on that cut, but you can play that thing. You can. And, you know, once you decide that you're going to play it, then you can optimize the driver. Yeah. And you've got no problem. Now, one of the things that I see when we're looking at a lot of the players that come in the second swing is they think they make a different swing every time because they're not consistent. And the biggest difference between the elite player and the player that we see on a regular basis is the elite player woke up one day and they were probably 10 or 12 years old and they knew exactly where the club face was. They knew what it felt like to hit the ball straight, what it felt like to hit a cut, what it felt like to hit a draw. And I'll see players in here and their swing will be very, very consistent, yep. but they don't have a feel for where the club face is. So on the technical mechanical side, understanding where the club face is, you know, if it's open 10 degrees on one swing and close seven degrees on the next swing, they think, oh my gosh, I made a terrible swing. Well, the swing wasn't that yeah. bad. The awareness of the club face is mm -hmm. the thing that I think more of our recreational players should be concentrating on. Sure. And, you know, they go in and they get instruction and they're like, oh yeah, use your big muscles, use your hips and your shoulders and the club will fall into place. But I don't think enough emphasis is always placed on mm -hmm. where is the club face. And that's the biggest thing that I see between the elite player mm -hmm. and the recreational player is awareness of the club face. Yeah. And um, so, you know, that makes a big difference in the fitting. Yeah, the fitting experience is very different for you then. You too. have to, you know, you have to go in there and say, how much of a partnership do we have here? Yeah. You know, I'm going to do my part and you are a 10-5 ping max yeah. with a regular 65 gram shaft. And that works great if you get your club face in a, a range. Yeah. But if you're way outside that range one way or another, mm -hmm. it's not going to be what you want. So you figure out what you're doing mm -hmm. there. We'll get you the club that works when you're in that range. And let's, uh, yeah. let's do this together. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a, it is a partnership. I think that's a great way to put it because there's, there's, it's a journey to get better in golf. And it does 
require a club fitter. It requires potentially a PGA instructor. And as that growth happens on in both of those avenues, it you know can can really end in a positive result with better scores. And uh, you know, like you said, it it starts by coming in here and understanding what you might be doing with the club face because you might not understand it. So um, I think that's actually kind of a great way to to wrap this thing up. Um, is is encouraging people to come get that fitting and uh, do it with someone like Cliff here at Second Swing, but ultimately you're going to learn a lot about your game, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a great way to kick things off if you're trying to get better. Absolutely. You will get an education and you will leave knowing things rather right. than wondering about them. Right, exactly. Well, golfers, thank you for watching and listening. Uh, make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel and uh, schedule that fitting with someone like Cliff. So Cliff, thank you for the time here. You bet. Thank you.